So just to remind you of who we are and, and why we don't follow the masses, um, has my screen populated family? The Bible lexicon? I can't see it. Okay. Which screen do you see, Elder? I can see it now. It just popped up. All oh, praises. So on your screen, this is the studylight.org, and, and this is the Hebrew lexicon. And I know it's not the pictographs. Uh, this is the uh, Syrian script, but you can see already this is the, the ah, the ma, and this is um, this is a, 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 a T. This is a, a, a Syrian script T, and they're saying amat, and amat is the word for truth or confirmation, and it's related to our word faith. And our word faith is amana, and amana means to be firm in something, to be sure to have stability, continuance, and faithfulness, reli reliableness. And that's what Amana is for the Hebrew. Let me scroll down and get you the uh, original script. <laughs> so here's the original word that we say for faith, the A, the M, and the N. The ox head, the quarter, and then the, uh, the seed of a man. The seed of a man. Um, so in the Hebrew, amana means we trusted in what we already know to be proven. We're not trusting in this um, what might, he shall, he, he may. We're trusting, we're standing in what was already f uh, established by the Most High ever since we came out of the garden. Ever since we left Eden, he's been with us. When we was in Egypt, he was with us. When we left Egypt, he was showing us that he's still with us, even when he's mad at us and punishing us. We have Amana. Amana is something that means it's established, it's reliable. So this is not the time to follow co-workers and, and follow the public. I'm not saying sit on your hands and don't do anything. That's foolishness. You know, we you know, be a good steward of your home and your finances, but don't don't follow these news clippings and, and these articles and have that as your guide, because our guide is the most high. So I want to just encourage you all, and, and I'm not a seer, you know, in, in Israel we have a seer, and a seer became known as a prophet, someone who, who has the gift to see the future. I don't have that. I don't believe I have that. But I, I have the ability to read and trust in what I read given to us by the Most High. So we don't, I don't subscribe to that um, Greco-Roman definition of, of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's Greek philosophy that creeped into our culture during the Greek captivity. And I'm not even sure if Paul really pinned that or not. If he did, he grew up in a Greek captivity, so he was being a Greek philosopher. So that definition that we learn in church is not what we as Israelites believe in. We hold to Amana, something that's already established, something that we know to be true, and the most high uh, salvation is true. So all praise to our Father. Um, with that, we're going to go into uh, the closing out of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And um, Elder, if you could... Could you offer up a prayer over the family before we get started? Come. Yeah, we just come before you this evening, Father, to magnify and glorify your name, Father. We enter your courts with praise and your gates with thanksgiving, Father. Thanking you and praising you, Father, for being the most high, Father. There's none above... <clears throat> There's none before you or above you, Father, but you reign alone, Father. You're supreme, and we thank you, Father. You're the author of all things, creator of heaven and earth, and earth and the fullness thereof is yours, Abba, and we just bless your name and give you the highest praise. Hallelujah. 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 And Abba, <clears throat> we come to you now, Father. Well, we want to thank you, Father, for uh, getting us through this day, Father, giving us life, health, and strength. Abba, we thank you, Father, for your loving kindness, your mercy, your grace, Father, your protection, your provision, 
Father, we thank you, Father, for giving your only begotten Son, Yeshua, that we may have life, abundant life, Abba, and that we may be back in covenant to you, Father, and worship you. Father, we come to you tonight, Father, asking that you forgive us for all the trespasses we've committed, Father. The sin, Father, we ask that you cleanse us, Father. Father, for, for any thought, action, intent, behavior, motive, Father, that went against your righteous instruction, your Torah, Father, we ask that you cleanse us, Father. Cleanse our minds and hearts, Father. Remove the iniquity, Abba. We pray that you wash us white as snow and create us a new heart and renew a right spirit within us, Father. And Abba, tonight we ask that <clears throat> we come against any spirit of fear, doubt, unbelief. We bind it in the name of Yeshua. Yes. Father, we ask you to loose your spirit of peace, love, understanding, wisdom, Father, as we come seeking you, Father, as we ask that you, by your spirit, help us rightly divide your word, Father, your truth. We ask that you give us understanding, Father, for we don't understand anything, Abba. Yes, we only understand what you um, reveal to us. And so, Father, we pray that the word that you give tonight, Father, that all minds and hearts are prepared, and Father, that the <clears throat> that it falls on fertile ground. Abba, for those that can't be present tonight, Father, we ask you to cover and protect them, to be with them. Yes. Um, and Father, we ask that you touch the Moray tonight as he delivers your message, Father, that you order his words. Father, we ask for a spirit of peace. Um, and <clears throat> we ask all of these things in Yeshua HaMashiach's name. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. Hallelujah. Glory be hallelujah. So uh, we're going to go ahead and close out the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we're going to turn to um, Leviticus chapter 23. And I have just a little piece of uh, flat bread. If you have a piece of your flat bread, your unleavened bread, you can go ahead and enjoy it with me. And we'll close out the feast and give uh, all honor to our king and our father. And and I played that song um common instrumental it was like a double entendre because yes we're going over uh multiple wives doctrine but also I, I saw an interview he did and he said he wrote that song to god and i don't know if he what god he subscribed to i'm not getting into that but uh he said he wrote that song to god and i thought that was interesting but it holds true for us we want to be faithful to him to the end because he's been faithful to us along the way. So if you have your scrolls, you can join me in Leviticus chapter 23, and we'll pick it up at verse, um, where we close out at? Verse six uh, through seven. Verse six through seven, actually verses six through eight. Leviticus 23 verses six through eight. And then we'll read this, and then we'll enjoy our flat bread and close out our feast. Come. 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 And it reads, And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Most High. Seven days must, must ye eat unleavened bread. Verse 7, In the first day you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Most High seven days. And in the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. So family, we know that we're still in captivity, and, and I don't know about your financial situation, but we wasn't able to physically uh, convocate and meet, or was I able to take off work but I have Amanah and my father that he saw my heart and he knows where he sent me and he's going to honor our sacrifice. So I'm going to offer up a prayer and then we can enjoy our flat bread. Mighty Yah, we come before your throne covered in the blood of our King. Thank you for a little bit of relief, Father, a little bit of freedom, Father, to enjoy the life you have set before us, Father. We don't complain about this captivity, Father. We, we know why we're here, Father. We know why you sent us here, Father. We ask that you continue 
to be patient with us, Father. We ask that you honor every sacrifice, every dollar spent, every mile traveled, Father, trying to get back to our ancient landmarks, Father. We ask that you honor us and grow us up strong, Father, and let us be righteous examples for the rest of your children. Let us walk in, in boldness and firmness as the Lion of Judah, but with peace and righteousness, Father. We ask that you honor this feast tonight, Father, through the blood and name of our high priest, the only begotten Son, the Lamb of, of the Most High, the Lion of Judah, Almighty Yeshua. Let the saints of Yah say amen. amen. Hallelujah. So with that, Sam, I'm going to partake Hallelujah. of some unleavened bread. And I made this batch tonight, and it's not bad. <laughs> Uh, don't, don't try that. It's don't try that. Mm -hmm. It's not as good as my wife, but I, um, I did my best I could. Mm. That's good. Oh, praises. Hallelujah. So, with that, family, we're going to go into... Operation SOS, save our sisters, and also save our brothers too, you know, because I haven't published any of the um, first two parts on YouTube yet, but I will. But we're also trying to save our brothers who uh, really, really have a, a righteous a righteous heart, and, and they think they're doing something that's, uh, you know, air quotes kosher. So we want to save our sisters and also save some of the brothers who have a humble heart and really want to please the Most High. And tonight, I mean, I may be biased, but I really think we, we presented a healthy case for anyone to do the research and, and take it themselves and see that this multiple wife culture is not intended for Israelites. And tonight, I saved the, you know, the, the most concrete evidence for last. So hopefully, when this get published, it do fall on some, uh, you know, some good soil. And uh, again, if any sisters are caught up in this lifestyle, if any sister is being abused, please reach out to us at tourgroup 12 at gmail.com. Share your story. If we can do anything to help you, um, just let us know. But this was inspired because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of man-made doctrines popping up and, um, a lot of sisters I'm hearing are being abused mentally, physically, and all, of course, emotionally, you know. So this is trying to help our sisters break free from this um, unholy, unset-apart lifestyle. So just to recap what we went over last, the last uh, class, part two, we, um, we established the fact that when we examine all our ancient, well, not all, Salaki, when we examine... Uh, a handful of scriptures that refer to Hebrew marriages, none of those scriptures ever mention uh, multiple wives. So again, like I mentioned last week or, or last class, our Sanhedrin set up a system that the world emulated, and they will review past rulings, past case laws to decide what to do about a case if it wasn't um, if it wasn't um, already ruled upon, you know, so the current judicial system, they pretty much copied off the Israelites. And that's what we did. We went, we examined some scriptures um, and we can't find any uh, scriptures where it mentions uh, holy couples as being uh, a man and a wife plus his concubines. Um, we found some examples of some sister wives and all the examples we found the system wasn't working. The first one we found was Hagar and Sarah. And even though Sarah encouraged it and pretty much forced Abraham, she later, she later repented and, and she wanted the woman out. And then we found, um, that was first Samuel, um, uh, Rebecca and, uh, Penny, uh, um, well, no, that, that was Genesis. Then we went to J Jacob and um, Jacob, Leah, and uh, Rachel, and the two sisters. These were two blood sisters. These wasn't two, two strangers Jacob was, you know, living with. These were two blood-born sisters, and they couldn't get along. 
they started competing for this one man, giving him their maids, trying to compete to have the most children. So if two blood-born sisters can't make this um, multiple wife lifestyle work, what makes brothers think that he can take complete strangers coming from different households, different regions of the world, and make it work? And then we found another example I think Queen was alluding to in First Samuel. First uh, Samuel with um, uh, Panina, Panina and Hannah. Hannah is uh, Samson's mom, I believe. Hannah is Samson's mom or Samuel's mom. And Panina and, and Hannah were sister wives. And they couldn't get along because... Panina was giving um, their, their husband children, and Hannah wasn't. And Panina was teasing Hannah because she was barren. She couldn't have children. So we don't have no examples of a healthy multiple wife, sister wife, uh, or wife concubine system. So I want to bring up one more, uh, not a sister wife system, but I want to go back to Abraham's life and just, I want you to put this on your mind about Abraham. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 24. Uh, no, Genesis 24 verses 2 to 4. Elder, are you good to read, Elder? You all right? Come. So we're going to read, let me do this one thing. I don't want to, how do I turn that off? Mm, I can't turn it off. All F1. Bear with me one second. I'm trying to turn this, this feature off for a second. All F1. Okay, let me see. Testing one, two, one, two. Can you hear me? Come. Testing one, two. Okay. All right. I'll let, I'll let it alone. So, Genesis 24, verses 2 to 4. Shema? Shema. Read, Elder. And Abraham said unto his elder servant of his house that, ru <clears throat> that ruled over all he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by Yahweh, the most high of heaven and the most high of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go into a country, and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. Take, take ten wives to Isaac? A wife, singular. Take a wife. Take a wife. And this right here has been cleaned up for the um, translation. But if you go back to verse 2, Abraham told his, his, his most trusted servant, put your hand under my thigh. He didn't put his hand under his thigh. He put his hands on his loins because that's an that's a Eastern culture. He made his servant swear on his own loins, don't give my son no, daughter, no wife from these Canaanites. Go back to my land and get my son one wife. And it wasn't nothing homosexual about that. People read our scrolls. They, they don't understand our culture. They don't know our language. And they make all kinds of assumptions. Abraham, we have his, his life recorded. Abraham was a man's man. He was a king. He was a priest. And he, and he ruled his house by the Torah. And these brothers are, are, are getting puffed up, claiming they're men of the book. And they're, they're more raised and they're leading these congregations, talking about I'm a man, I'm a man. And they're describing their manhood by how forceful they can speak and how much they can uh, uh, rule and how they can collect women. And they're defining manhood by these secular standards. And I would like to pose a question to them. Because I read somewhere that the Messiah had a beloved disciple that, that linked his head on the Messiah's breast. So the Messiah let this disciple lean his head on his chest. 
will you dare say that our Messiah is feminine? When I read that he's coming back with a sword? When he took the, the most brutal punishment that no man could take? Was our Messiah feminine? So these people getting puffed up, talking about I'm a man and we men over here, they have a lack of understanding. They don't have the spirit of the Most High in them at all. So I just want to bring out, because we're going to focus on Abraham's life tonight. Abraham made his servant swear on his own loins that you will not take a wife from the Canaanites, go back to my land, but only get one wife. Abraham, if you continue this story, family, Abraham was very wealthy by now. The Most High had blessed him. He had, he had defeated uh, kings and everything. Abraham had cattle, sheep, and everything, so he could have bought uh, Isaac as many wives as he wanted. He said, go get one wife. So just lay that to heart as we go through the study. Lay that to heart as we go through the study. So uh, we talked about sister wives, no examples of, of a successful sister wife system. And the last thing we brought out last class is, because the brothers like to mention King David and, and King Solomon. King David and King Solomon are the go-to to, to uh, support a multiple wife lifestyle. And the, the metaphor analogy I bring up is us growing up in the urban city idolizing drug dealers. You're idolizing a drug dealer. Look at all the money. Look at all the cars. Look at all, everyone loves him. But you don't, as a child, you don't see that he has women all throughout the cities and states. He has uh, children he ain't fathering. His mom's house is getting raided. Um, and then you don't see the time he spent in jail. As a child, all you see is so-and-so got money. So these brothers putting King David and King Solomon as their go-to, look how their life ended. We brought out that King David life ended. He had to kill his own son. His own son was trying to, uh, was trying to kill him, and his soldiers wound up killing his son. And he couldn't do nothing about it because he knew his soldiers was righteous in killing his son. And after that, King David finally went home, and he put up his ten concubines. Said he put them up and didn't touch them no more. It took all of that for King David to finally realize my house is in shambles because of the lifestyle I chose. And we're going to read that again before we get started. Uh, his son, King Solomon, that's their go-to. King Solomon was, was the wisest man in Israel, and he had multiple wives. He had wives from every nation. Look how King Solomon's life turned out. Our nation, the 12 tribes of Israel, was torn because of King Solomon. The 12 tribes have never been back together again because of King Solomon. So the, the two greatest patriarchs in our history, great men, great warriors, but they had this one flaw, and that's who you want to hang your lifestyle on? You have to take a second look to see what's going on. So let's get that one verse we ended with. When, when King David was talking about his life, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 23. Because if a, if a brother really has a, 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 a genuine heart and a humble heart, and he really want to live a life pleasing to the Most High, once he reads what David says here, he will let go every wife he has that's not the first one. This is 2 Samuel 23. And... Let's start it again at verse 2. 2 Samuel 23, verses 2 through 6. Shema. Shema. 23, 2 to 6. Khan, Elder Khan. Khan. Shema. Verse 2. Oh, you want me to read? Yeah, if you could. Okay. <clears throat> the spirit of Yah spake by, by me, and his word was in my tongue. The Most High of Israel said, The Rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of Yah. And he shall be as a light in the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clearing, excuse me, by clear shining after rain. 
So one second, let me, let me jump in here. So King David just said, the man that's going to rule Israel, he should be bright as the sun. He should be bright as the sun. His life should be full of light. And we know that's a metaphor for being righteous, right? So he says the man that's going to rule Israel should be as the light when it's rising in the morning without any clouds. And y'all know how the sun, if you ever driving and the sun is coming up on the horizon and you mess around and, and, and come over that hump and you ain't got your sun visor down or shades on, you could almost have an accident. So the, Dave, King David is saying that's how the man should be who, who rules the 12 tribes. Now watch what he say next. Elder verse 6. Verse 6. But the sons of Bel Belial. I'm sorry, Elder. I'm sorry. It's Salaki, Elder. Verse 5. I'm sorry. Oh, don't worry. Verse 5. Although my house be not so with Yah. Say what? Yet he had, although my house be not so with the Most High. He's saying, he just told you how, how we should rule. Because we know all the kings are supposed to come from Judah. All the kings are, are supposed to come from David's loins. So the priests come from Aaron, kings come from Judah. He just said all the kings from Judah, from my, from my line, should rule, and their, their life should be bright as the sun. Then he says, although my house wasn't so. So David's letting you know he realized that his house was a mess. And he, now he knows he's about to die in his old age. He finally realizes why his life or why his house is a mess. So these, these are the examples you want to bank your life on? They're not showing these sisters these verses. All they're showing the sisters is that King David and Solomon had multiple wives. David just said, my house wasn't so. And then he goes on and, and verifies that even though my house wasn't like that, the Most High had mercy and still kept his covenant with me that, that, that my, my posterity should rule Israel. But what I want the brothers to focus on, and the sisters too, verse 5, although my house be not so with Yah, this is why King David was a man after the Most High's own heart. He didn't hide his sin. He didn't hide his sin. So with that, family, let's finish this study. And we're going to go into what's the source of this. Um, I don't want to keep saying polygamy because I don't want to uh, have a, a negative connotation because I think these brothers, some of these brothers really think that it's, it's a kosher lifestyle. But we're going to examine, let's examine the, the source of multiple wives. Because when our, when our scriptures have contradictions, it, it causes for us to do a deeper study. So if you got your hand out, I'm on page four, and we're going to pick it up with where did the polygamy system originate? The polygamy system or the multi-wife system, meaning you have a wife and concubines. And sometimes it, 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 uh, the, the text says, multiple wives, and multiple concubines. But we're going to examine where this culture started from. And we definitely know, we, we discovered in, the, in part one, it definitely wasn't in Eden, because in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 2 and 23, the Most High says, I took her from your flesh, therefore man shall leave his mother and father, cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one. You can't twist that and say two should be three. And we also brought out that Genesis 2.23 is a commandment. Even though it's not listed like, uh, like uh, Exodus, thou shalt not, that's a commandment. If you choose a wife, you're supposed to leave your mother and father and cleave to that wife, and the two shall be one. So we know in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't no multiple wife system. So let's see if we can find out where this thing started at. Um, let's go to Genesis 2.24. Genesis 2.24. Shema. Genesis 2.24. 
Read. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. That's black and white. We don't need a breakdown of that. And like we brought out, once the Most High give us a commandment, for you to say that it's off the table, you have to show us where it says the two should no longer be one flesh, but the three and the four and the five are going to be one flesh. Because we went over example of when the Most High retracted something. We went over two examples when he explicitly changed his mind. But we can't find where he changed his mind about a kosher or set-apart marriage. So this is commandment. If you can't show me nowhere where the Most High has changed this, this commandment still stands. Now let's cross-reference this with um, Genesis 4.19. Genesis 4.19. I, I want to bring something out here. Genesis 4.19. Shema. Genesis 4.19, read. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Adah, and the name of the other, Zillah. Anyone know who Lamech is? Who's Lamech's father? Was it uh, Enoch? Yep. Now keep going up. If you if you go back up and check trace his lineage, Lamech lineage goes back to Cain. And you can see it at the beginning of chapter four. So somebody double check me when you get a chance. And if you if you find out different, I you know I'm always humble, I make a correction. But the first time I see a man taking multiple wives in the Bible is here with Lamech. And Lamech is the great-grandson or great-great-grandson of Cain. Cain slew Abel. So the first man who took multiple wives come from the seed of Cain. And that's who you want to emulate? Cain? That's something to lay the heart here. Mm. That's something to lay the heart. And we know the story of Cain and Abel. So the first time, and again, I'm going to publish this, and I don't have no pride. I'm not trying to be right. I'm trying to make sure we all righteous because I am my brother's keeper. We ain't trying to destroy our brothers or chop heads off. We want to make sure we're right, a holy people, to, to be presented to the Messiah. But the first time I see a man taking two wives is here with Lamech. And when you go back up, you can see it right here. Let's go back up to... Um, Verse 15, Eldon, we go back down to where we read to. Come. And Yah said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And Yah set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So the Most High didn't want Cain to be killed. And he says, I'm going to mark Cain so we all know who Cain is. And anyone kills Cain, Sevenfold is going to be done to him because the Most High says, I'm reser I, I have reserved judgment for Cain. So any man kill Cain, I'm going, to, I'm going to do sevenfold times him. So Cain was marked. So being that these were dark people, Cain might have had a patch of um, blonde hair or he might have had um, a, a, a part of leprosy somewhere on his face. So everyone knew that was Cain. Because the Most High told Cain, what you did to your brother Abel, I got, some, I got a judgment reserved for you, and I don't want no man to rob me of my judgment from you. So he marked Cain. Read on. Verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Most High and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begat Mahuajel, and Mahuajel begat Methuselah. Yeah, you're doing good, Elder. Methuselah, I think Methuselah. 
Did we lose your elder? I don't know if we lost Elder. Elder, your your mic just cut out. <coughs> so, and it says Tilakia. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had that. My 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 battery died. My apologies. Um, and I'll read verse uh, eighteen. And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad Mahuajel, and Mahuajel begat Methusa El, and Methusa El begat Lamech. There it is. Lamech comes from Cain's line. Lamech comes from Cain's line. So you're following the fallen son when you take these multiple wives because he's the first one I see listed where it says he took two wives. So just mark that in your Bible. And again, I'm a humble man. If I'm wrong, I have no problems in retracting. But based on my research, this is the first man mentioned who took multiple wives. And it wasn't so in Eden because his, his great great grandfather Adam didn't do the, didn't do it. So where did he get this from? He didn't get it from Adam. So just bear that in mind. This multiple wives, the first one who did it was the great great grandson of Cain. Um, so now what we're gonna do, family? I got if you got your handout. I gave a handout before we um, left Shabbat on Saturday. We're going to go into the complete works of Philo, and let me pull it up on the screen here. We're going to go into the complete works of Philo. Philo was born uh, about 15 years before the Messiah, so he was a little older than, than the Messiah. He most likely saw the Messiah when they came to Egypt uh, because they said the Messiah was a special child, and everyone wanted to see him. So it's a good chance Philo saw the Messiah. He's a little older than the Messiah. So let me share my screen. And just Shemai when you can see the complete works of Philo. If you have the handout, this is, um, I tried to write it on, on everyone's handout. I ran out of time. If you have your handout with you, we're going to start with the one that says um, the first page starts with from from the circumstances the historians call Leah. So if, if you got the handout with you, it's the it's the one is is stapled two pages, and the first sentence says from the circumstances the historians call Leah. And if you want to write the source down, you can see it on the screen. It's the complete works of Philo. The chapter is the preliminary studies, and it's page 307. The complete works of Philo, the preliminary studies, page 307. So we're going to get some, some history on where this um, multiple wives concubine system came from. So, um, Elder, did it populate the PDF? Uh, yeah, I can see it on the screen. All praises. So now... I, I, um, I don't have my copy. Um, okay. Yes, yeah, in the car, actually. No worries. I can read it. All right. Where do I want to start? Okay. So this is a chapter on um, the mating. Let me, let me, for the sake of time, I want you to see this chapter. And if you have your, your hand out, you can see. Elder, has the title uh, populated? Yes, it has. So this is a chapter on mating, on mating couples and families. So you see it starts, but the wife of Sarah, but Sarah, the wife of Abraham, had not borne him any child. And she had a, an Egyptian handmaid whose name was Hagar. So it goes into that history. But we came for this right here. We came for this right here. It says, let me make it bigger. Hope people on Facebook can see this. Yeah, a little bit. So it says, but these men were husbands of many wives and concubines. 
not only of such as were citizens, as the sacred scriptures tell us, but Isaac had neither many wives nor concubines at all, but only his first and wedded wife, who lived with him all his life. I'm going to read this again. But these men were husbands of many wives and concubines, not only of such as were citizens, as the sacred scriptures tell us, but Isaac, the promised seed, Isaac, the promised seed, had neither many wives nor any concubine at all, but only his first and wedded wife, who lived with him all his life. Why was this? Why was this? Because the virtue acquired by teaching, which Abraham pursues, requires many things, both such as are legitimate according to prudence, and such also as are illegitimate according to the exegetical contemplations of preliminary instruction. Please, please, family, catch this. And there is also a virtue which is made perfect by practice to which Jacob appears to have been devoted. For exercises consist of many and various dogmas and doctrines, some leading and others following, some leading the way and others arriving later, and bringing at one time more serious and at other times lighter labors. But the self-instructed race of which Isaac was a partaker the excellent country of the mastery over the passions has received as its share a nature simple and unmixed and unalloyed, standing in no need of either practice or instruction in which there is need of the concubine sciences and not only of the citizens' wives. For when the Most High showered down from above that most requisite benefit of knowledge, self-taught, and having no need of a preceptor, it would be impossible any longer for a man to live with the slavish and concubine arts, having a desire for bastard doctrines as his children. Somebody but bless the Most High. Somebody bless the Most High. What did Philo just say? Philo says, the men before Abraham and Isaac, they practiced multiple wives and concubines. But when Abraham separated himself and the Most High started dealing with him and he raised Isaac, he had no need for a slave system because the Most High had showered him with a much better way of life than the concubine sciences. He had no need of this slave system. Let's get another um, piece of history from this writing. Hallelujah. Let's get one more reference from here. This is a chapter on Abraham. This, this chapter is all about Abraham. So, he talks about when Abraham left Babylon. He says, And the most visible proof of this migration in which the mind quitted astronomy and the doctors of the Chaldeans is this. For it is said in the scriptures that the very moment that the wise man quitted his abode, the Most High appeared to Abraham. From whom, therefore, it is plain that he was not visible before when he was adhering to the studies of the Chaldeans. What did Philo just say? Philo says the Most High taught to Abraham, but he didn't show himself to Abraham till he left Babylon. So Abraham left Babylon and the Babylonian practices. These brothers told my flee Babylon, but you got her in your back seat when you got these wives. 
You can't flee Babylon and you keep her practices. Multiple wives in the concubine system came from Babylon. Now, family, I'm going to take you all the way back to when we first started meeting and we were going over the uh, patriarchs and their lineage. The three sons of Noah, Ham, Japhite, and, and um, Shem. Who was Babylon? Um, who was the first king of Babylon? Anybody remember? Say that again, Ark. What was the question? Who was the first king of Babylon? Nebuchadnezzar. Nimrod? Nimrod? Say it. Nimrod. Nimrod. Oh, Nimrod. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sure. Nimrod was the first king of Babylon. Who was Nimrod's father? I, I, on the tip of my tongue, it's like uh, Am, uh, Ter, Amran or I forget. Nimrod. Oh, I'm tripping him. Him. Ham was his grandfather. Grandfather. So it was Ham. Ham had Canaan, and Canaan had Nimrod. Yeah. What did Abraham say about Canaan? When Canaan, when, when, when Ham saw his father Noah naked after Noah got drunk with the grapes, what did Noah say to, say to Ham? He cursed him. Cursed be who? Canaan. Cursed be Canaan. So you're following Canaan, Canaan's son Nimrod. You're following Babylon. You're following a cursed lineage. When you, when you follow this multiple wife lifestyle, it's from Canaan. Nimrod is his, is his son. So these brothers talking about y'all better flee, y'all better flee, but you got her in your back seat. And, and, and the best metaphor I can come up with Y'all remember watching Scooby Doo and, and, and Shaggy and Scooby always thought they was out running the ghost and the ghost right behind them. <laughs> That's what these brothers are doing. Y'all better flee Babylon. It starts come out of her. Flee Babylon. But you got four or five wives. Abraham, Abraham left Babylon and follow says, soon as he left Babylon, the most high appeared to him. He couldn't see a manifestation of the Most High while he was around those uh, those Hamites. He, the Most High was talking to him, but the Most High didn't manifest, manifest himself to Abraham till he left Babylon. So you have to leave Babylon and all her ways to please the Most High. When you say you want multiple wives, you're following Babylon. That's where the system originated at. What does Revelation say about Babylon? What is it called, Babylon? The great whore. The great whore. And if you have a multiple wives, you are a whore, and those women are whores. Deal with it. Deal with it. I'm in my finia season, family. I don't want y'all all to be there because we're not a cult, but this is where I'm at. If you have multiple wives, you and those women are whores because you're following the great whore, Babylon. Deal with it. I'm trying to save our sisters and our brothers here. So let's get one more reference from this uh, Philo. And let's go to, Are you just, to just to confirm. Write a two for me. Um, oh, I'm on, I'm on page 418. Oh, we just read that one. So we're done with Philo. We're done with follow. So all these customs of having a wife and a concubine, it's Babylonian systems. It's a, ba a Babylonian system. So family, we're going to end this study going back to the life of King David and his son. So if you got your hand out, we're going back to King David and his son. And we're going to read once again. We're going to read 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 8. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 8. Come out of her family. Come out of Babylon. More than one wife is Babylonish. You have on Babylonish garments. 2 Samuel verse 12. Oh, so, so lock it. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 8. Shema. Shema. 
Read. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto you the such and such things. I almost didn't uh, present this class because of this scripture. Because when I read that the Most High gave David his master's wives, I was like, wow, what? I said, well, there it is. We can't argue with the Most High. The Most High says, I gave you your master's wives. So I was like, I was, st I was stumped. I was like, I, I don't have nothing to say. The Most High is, is telling David, I gave you your master's wives, and you still wasn't happy. You went and coveted this man's wife and committed murder. So the Most High only checked David when he committed murder. But as far as the, the multiple wives, the Most High is saying, I gave you your master's wives, and the Most High knew about all the other wives. So these brothers look like, hey, you can't, you, you can't say nothing about this system. But again, like, I, like we brought out last class, when we got a direct commandment, and let's read it again for, for anyone just picking this study up. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 17, 17. Because anytime we find something that directly contradicts something the Most High said, we got we to gotta take a look at it. Because an atheist or a Muslim will, will rip you to shreds. Like your, your, your book, your Bible is contradicting itself. So let's pick up Deuteronomy 17 and 17. Did I call it right? I mean, uh, yeah. Shema. Read. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. So if you go back up to grab the context, this is talking about the kings of Israel. No king of Israel is supposed to multiply wives to himself. So this alludes to two things. If I'm not a king, I can have multiple wives. And that leads to the question, well, A, why did, why did David, being a king, have multiple wives? Because if the Most High is saying here, kings can't have multiple wives, and he's saying I gave David wives, then this whole book, our whole lifestyle, is a contradiction. So what's going on? Because just like we, we, we brought out James, James says a double-minded a double minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. So is our, is our father unstable? It calls for a deeper study, but these brothers don't want to dig deeper because, hey, multiple wives, you're winning. You're winning. So why would you try to even, why would you double check to, 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 to see if you're right or not? It's like when your mom, when your mom said you can have extra dessert. You ain't going to say, Mom, are you sure? No. Soon as she say, go ahead, you're appearing on. You're off. So these brothers ain't going to double check to see if, this is, if it's something deeper because they're filling their flesh. But this book from cover to cover can't contradict themselves. If not, everything we hold, up to, everything we hold to is a, is a fraud. So we have to do a deeper study. So the brother's going to hit you with, well, it says kings should multiply wives. So if I ain't no king, I can have multiple wives. But remember what we said as Israelites, the Torah is our, is our go-to. And in Genesis 2 and 23, it wasn't the Torah, but it was the uh, Salakia. Torah just means instructions. So just because it doesn't read thou shall not and thou shall doesn't mean it's not Torah. Torah is just a Hebrew word. It's nothing fancy. It means instructions. So every time the Most High gives us instructions, those are Torah, that's Matazawa. That's Matazawa. So if you can't find what the Most High says, and you should cleave to multiple women, and y'all should be one unit, you're in error. So no, kings can't have multiple wives, neither can a single man. Only way a single man can have a multiple wife in Israel is if your brother died and he didn't raise no seed up. That's the only way. Jacob's situation is a one-off, and Jacob didn't want that. Jacob served 14 years for one woman. Jacob did not serve one month for Leah. 
That's what people don't understand. Jacob served those 14 years for Rachel. And it says it seemed but a day. He only took Leah because his uncle made him. He didn't want Leah. And it was evident when he met his brother Esau, how Leah was put up right behind the slave, uh, uh, the maid's children. So Jacob is not an example because Jacob didn't want that. Jacob was raised by a righteous man, Isaac, and he knew his dad had one wife, his grandfather had one wife, Jacob only wanted Rachel. So what makes the Most High says, I gave you multiple wives? Why would he say that? We have to be Berean Jews and go below the surface. So let's go to Joshua, Joshua 24. Let's go to Joshua chapter 24. We're trying to save our sisters and, and brothers who, who have a humble heart. Joshua 24, and we're going to pick it up at verse uh, 29. Elder, I'll give you a break if you need one. No, I'm good. Joshua chapter 24, verses 29 to 31. Shema. Shema. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Most High, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Tamanthasera, which is in Mount Ephraim on the north side of the hill of Gosh. So Joshua's dead. Read. And Israel served the Most High all the days of Joshua. In all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, and which had known all the works of the Most High that he had done for Israel. So when Joshua was living and the elders that outlived Joshua, Israel walked the fine line because those men didn't play. Joshua did not play. If you broke the law, we got an example, you were killed. Read on uh, verse 32. And the bones of Joshua which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him in a hill that pertained to Phinehas, his son, which, give, which was given him in Mount Ephraim. So family, these three names just mentioned were very austere men. They did not play with the Torah. Joshua, uh, Eleazar, and Phinehas did not play. If you were caught picking up sticks on the Sabbath, if you had Babylonish garments, if you had took a, a, a foreign wife, these three men will kill you. But now these three patriarchs are dead. Let's find out what happened. Judges 2, Judges 2, verses 10 through 13. What was the first verse on? Judges 2, uh, verses 10 through 13. Shema. Shema. Read. And also, all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Most High, nor yet the works which had done, which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Most High and served Balaam. Serve who? Balaam. Our patriarchs who were fear, fearless and fearful are gone. This new generation, the new jacks are coming up, and they say, we ain't seen the sea part depart. We ain't see the mountain smoke. We're doing our own thing, and we're over here with the Canaanites. We're going to serve Balaam. Read on. And they forsook the Most High, the, the Almighty of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Most High to anger. 
and they forsook the Most High and served Baal and Ashtaroth. That's where we get Easter from. Ashtaroth is another is the archaic word for Easter. That's who they're serving for Easter, Ashtaroth. So our great patriarchs are dead. These new generations are going are committing wickedness. Let's get closer to David's life. Let's get closer to David's time. Uh, Judges 5 and verse 8. We're going to walk up to, to, uh, to David's era. Judges 5 verse 8. Shema. 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 Read. They chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or a spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? They chose new gods. And soon as they chose new gods, there was war in the gates. The Most High told us that. The Most High told us that. But this new generation, they're doing their own thing. Let's get the next one, Judges 17. Judges 17. And we'll pick this one up at verse 3. Uh, Judges 17, verses 3 to 5. Shema. 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 Read. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Most High for my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. This woman says, I had this money. I'm going to make a graven image to the Most High. What is going on here, family? Read. Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder, who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And the oh. man Micah had a house of gods, and made an ephod, and teraphim, and consecrated one of his sons, who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Did what, Elder? Did what was right in their own eyes. This right here, without knowing the history of Israel, it, 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 it goes over people's heads. This man, Micah, has made a, a, a teraphim and an ephod. That's what the priests wear. That's what the 12 stones were on, on the priest's chest. He has made one, and he done made one of his sons a priest. Now, we don't know if he's a Levite or not. But he done made one of his sons a priest, and you got idols in your house. Are you kidding me? Let's pick. Let's drop down to verse uh, seven. And there was a young man out of Be Bella, well, excuse me, Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. So here come a real Levite. Let's drop down to verse eleven and find out what happened. And the, excuse me, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. We have a Levite that's content to dwell in a house with idols. This generation is gone. This generation is gone. This Levite is content to live in Micah's house and be his priest, and there's idols in here. Let's see if we can get closer to David's time. Let's go to Judges 19 and 1. Judges 19 and 1. Shabbat. Read. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of the Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Took, took to him a what? A concubine. Let's double back and get our tour work. This is our go-to. Let's go back. Hold, hold your hand there, Elder, and let's flip back to Leviticus uh, chapter 10. A Levite just took a concubine. Are you kidding me? Leviticus 10, Leviticus 10 and 11. A Levite just took a concubine to be his woman. Shema. Shema. Read. And that, excuse me, and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Most High has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. And this is, he's talking to the Levites here. Y'all are in charge of teaching Israel 
all my statues that I told that, that I told to Moses. Let's drop down and get uh, verse uh, 20. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's turn over to um, Leviticus 21 and 7. The Levites had a charge to teach us the most highest ways. This Levite then took a concubine. Let's drop, drop over to 21 and 7. Leviticus 21 and 7. Shema. Read. They shall not take a wife that is a whore. That is a what? A whore. What is a concubine? A whore. Pretty much a whore. And if she's not a whore, go ahead and finish that, Elder. Or profane. Neither shall they take a woman put away from her husband. For he is holy unto his, unto his power. So, so if they want to play word games and say a concubine wasn't a whore, a Levite can't take nothing for his wife but another Levite. The, Levi, the Levitical priesthood was to remain set apart. So we're, we're in a generation, we can go back to uh, Judges now, Judges 19. We're in a generation where the Levites done started breaking the law. And they had the charge to teach us the Torah. If anyone was supposed to stay with the Most High, it's Levi. So let's get a little closer to David's time. Let's double back to Judges 17 and 6. Judges 17 and 6. I'm going to try to pick up some speed so we can, I know it's a work night. But this got to be brought out. This got to be brought out. Judges 17 and 6. Shabbat. And in those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It sounds like what's going on today, family. We have no Levite that we know about. Judah is, is scattered to the four winds, and every man is doing what's right in his own eyes. But we got the Torah. The Torah is black and white. Every man should have his wife. Cleave to your wife. The two shall be one flesh. You don't need no moray. You don't need no uh, priest or no Levite to, to interpret that. These brothers got all two and three hour breakdown videos, but you can't you can't decipher every. The two shall be one. Come on, I, listen me with that. Let's get that righteous. Let's get that righteous. Let's get it again, Elder. Let's get it in Judges twenty one and twenty five. And this is to the end of Judges. The next book is Ruth. And y'all know Ruth is David's great grandma. So we're getting closer to David's time. Judges 21, verse 25. Shema. Read. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So, boom. This is the time David grew up in. Our own Levites then gave the Most High their butts to kiss. That's how serious this is. Now, we're going to skip Ruth because we know Jesse, Jesse was born from Ruth. Let's skip Ruth. But now we got a better picture of what era David grew up in. Let's go over to 1 Samuel. Let's go over to 1 Samuel chapter 2, and let's pick it up at verse 12. 1 Samuel chapter 2, and let's pick it up at verse 12. Shema. 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 You said it's 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Come. Okay. Now the sons of Eli were the sons of Belial. They knew not the most high. So the backstory here, you can read it on your own. Eli, we want to see Eli's a priest, and Samuel was recording. That Eli's son, who are priests, because if Eli's a Levite, his sons are Levites. And Samuel is recording that Eli's sons are sons of Baal. That's just another um, another spelling for Baal. You know, they, they play with these translations. So Samuel is recording for us that e Eli, a Levite, has some sons, and they are the sons of Baal. Let's, let's turn over and let's pick up verses 22 to 23. 22 to 23. Verse 22. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of mm -hmm. the congregation. 
These are the Levites. Mercy. These Levites, our, our Hebrew S's are coming to the temple to, to worship the Most High or, or maybe give some offerings or some repentance. And these Levites are sleeping with them. Are you kidding me? And you wonder why we're jacked up over here and, and this nasty behind the United States. And these brothers, this is what you want to emulate? And you out here teaching, talking about you this and you that, and we men over here? This is why we all messed up. This is not a game. And these sisters are coming up with a pure heart and, go and, and think that you got some truth, and, and, and they're cement to this mess. And, and this is what we're going to present to the Messiah when he come back? You got 10 wives in your house. Come on, man. Read, Elder. <clears throat> Verse 23. Be quiet, I said. And he said unto them, Why do you such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. So Eli is checking them. I heard what you're doing to the people. So... Let's drop down for the sake of time. Let's drop down to verses 27 to 29. 1 Samuel 2, verses 27 through 29. Shema. Verse 27. And there came a man unto Yah, unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Most High, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Who's his father, y'all? Um, well, it had to be Aaron. Who's Aaron's what father? Uh, Who's Aaron's father? Levi. Levi, Levi. 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 He's talking about Levi. Mm -hmm. Read. And I chose him out of the, I chose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear ephod before me. And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? So the priest got to eat the fried chicken. The Most High saying, I made a covenant with your dad, and I gave him that nice ephod to wear, and I let him eat all the good fried chicken that the children of Israel was bringing to you. Read. Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest the sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. So now the Most High is checking, not the sons, the Most High is checking Eli. He says, you knew what your boys was doing, and, and they're robbing me because if you go back and read this story, as we were bringing sacrifices, these evil priests would take, go ahead, queen. They'd take the good meat out and save it for themselves and, and put an inferior uh, chicken or whatever or whatever it was and offer that to the Most High and, and eat that sacrifice. So the Most High is checking Eli, saying, you knew what your boys was doing, and I made a covenant with your, with your father, Levi, and, and this is what you allowed to go on? So he's checking Eli, and, and let's find out what he tells Eli. Let's, let's just, since we're here. Um, verse 30. Verse 30. Mm -hmm. Verse 30. Wherefore the Most High of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and thy house, excuse me, in the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now Yah saith, be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So the good priests, I'm going to keep my covenant to them because I made a covenant with Levi, but those wicked priests that come from your, your, your lineage, I'm going to destroy them. Read. Verse 31. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house that there shall not be an old man in thy house. So now he's making a separation in the uh, tribes of Levi. Everybody's coming from Eli. I'm going to cut your sons and your grandsons off. I'm going to wait till another generation pop up, and I'm going to work with those Levites. But everybody from Eli, he's saying, I ain't going to let them die. Or, uh, I'm not going to let them die old men. They're going to die young. If you finish the story, he, there's, his sons die young. 
That's what the Most High told Eli for him not checking his sons. Now, let's cross this with Malachi 2 and 8. Let's cross check this with Malachi chapter 2 and, and verse 8. We're jacked up because our priesthood got jacked up. You said Malachi? Yeah, Malachi chapter 2. We're going to pick it up at verse 8. Shabbat. Verse 8. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Most High of hosts. Elder, can you please read that again? Please, Elder, can you read that again? Come. Verse 8. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Most High of hosts. This is why we're all jacked up. The Levites have butchered the covenant. This is why we're jacked up. So this is the generation that David is coming into. This is the generation that David is coming into. So we're almost done here, family. I'm going to share with you, share with you a document. And I meant to have some handouts for you, but uh, I forgot about this one. This is the generation that David was born into. So let me share my screen and we're almost done, family. I'm going to share with you uh, uh, one of the ancient writings. And this is the pseudepigrapha. And this is the pseudepigrapha of the Old Testament. And it has a writing in here, a fragment from one of the priests of um, Zadok's sons. Has it populated yet? Con, I can see it. So you can download this. Again, I'll share any PDF I have. I've read the history of this. This is definitely a vetted. It was most of it was in Paleo Hebrew. Some of it did have Aramaic writing on it, but this is a fragment of a uh, of a Zadok, uh, son of a Zadok. So we're going to read just a little bit of this fragment about Zadok. So, Elder, can you let me make it smaller? Okay, can you still see it, or I can read it if not. I can see it, but you'll have you'll have to. Uh, there we go. So this is the fragment of the doc, and this is a chapter of chapter seven on the sin of fornication. Family, hang in there. Please listen to this. Read. Starting with verse one, or yes, sir. The builders of the wall. Come. The builders of the wall who walk after the law. The law it is which talks of which he said, assuredly they shall talk, are caught by fornication and taking two wives during their lifetime. They are caught by what? By fornication and taking two wives during their lifetime. But uh -huh. the fundamental principle of the creation is male and female created he, them. And they who went into the ark, two and two went into the ark. And as to the prince it is written, he shall not multiply unto himself. He shall not multiply wives unto himself. So it's referring to the Torah. The prince or the king of Israel should not multiply wives to himself. He's reminding them of the Torah. Read on. But David read not in the book of the law that was sealed, which, which was in the ark. For it was not open in Israel from the day of the death of Eleazar and Joshua and the elders who served Ashtaroth. Didn't we just read that in, in Judges, how after the patriarchs went to sleep, the next generation came up and did whatever they wanted to do? Con. So all these years building up to David being born, we had no righteous uh, priest. We had no righteous priest. 
the, the, the Torah, the written Torah, the stones were locked away inside the ark. And these priests, we just went over the history. These priests started doing what they wanted to do. They were taking concubines. They're disrespecting the most high sacrifices. This is the era David was born into. So if you go back to the Torah, I won't for the sake of time, but every pre Salakia, every king of Israel is supposed to write out the Torah for himself so he'll know it by heart and he could, he could be a righteous judge over Israel. But David didn't read the Torah. So this is why David committed fornication with all these women because the Torah was locked away and the priests fell away from their job. Let's finish this, finish this up, Elder. And it was hidden. And it was hidden and was not discovered until Zadok arose. Now they glorify the deeds of David, save only the blood of Uriah. And the Most High abandoned them to him. So he's saying the written Torah that Moses received was locked away until this righteous priest came up. And his name is Zadok. Zadok in the Hebrew is righteousness. And if y'all know the story or heard it of the uh, king Melch uh, Melchizedek, Melchizedek is a corruption of two Hebrew words. Melchizedek is a corruption of Malak, which means king, and Malak Zadok, king of righteousness. So Zadok is a righteous Levite that rose up, and he the one started reestablishing the written Torah. So David is saying the only thing David committed or the only thing the most high charged David with was the blood of Uriah. So being Berean's family, why wouldn't the most high, why did the most high charge him with the blood of Uriah, but not all the women? What, what clear... What clear indication that the Most High saw that David knew he was wrong for, for what he did to Uriah? He did it. He was doing things in secret. Absolutely. David showed his guilt when he tried to have uh, Uriah come home from the war and sleep with Bathsheba. And then when that didn't work, Uriah was so faithful to him he said he told them, well, put Uriah on the front line then in the heat of the battle. So David didn't try to hide the multiple wives because he didn't know it was wrong. Because this history is saying the tour was locked away. But David knew it was wrong what he did to Uriah because he tried to cover it up. So that's why the Most High judged him for what he did to Uriah and killed the baby. But the, the Most High didn't kill David or Bathsheba because they stayed together and their next child was Solomon. So David showed his guilt for Uriah when he tried to cover it up. But all the women, he didn't know he was doing nothing wrong because the priests failed their job. The priests failed their job. Mm. For the sake of time, I won't read it because we're going into 10 o'clock. But y'all can look it up for yourself. Much known, much required. Much known, much required. David didn't know that he shouldn't have had all those women because he had no he had no example. That our history is so ancient, family. From the time Joshua died in Eleazar to the time David was born were, were generations. Just like now, if the brothers would be honest, I'm going to admit that the most high probably won't lead us to their charge. Because we don't have no righteous priest. We're, we're scattered to the four winds eating defiled bread. So the Most High really can't hold this to their charge because we don't have no righteous teacher yet. But when Yeshua returns, he's going to get us back together, back in line. And that's when we, you definitely won't have an excuse. So right now, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm put. I pretty much say the case is, is, is closed because we got the tour. We got Adam and Adam and Eve. So if their heart don't convict them and, and they, re they see this, this, this class and says, ah, he's crazy. He don't know what he's talking about. If, if they really believe that way, maybe the most high have mercy on them like he did David. But 
we've laid out a case, family. Multiple wives is not acceptable. It's just that the Levites broke the covenant, and now David had, had a way out because he was innocent. He didn't know this was wicked according to the Most High because he didn't try to hide the women, but he did try to hide Uri Uriah's death. So let's bring this home and let's get some, um, let's, let's validate this work from Zadok, this, this Zadokai uh, work. Let's validate this, this work here. Let's, uh, let's go to First Chronicles, First Chronicles 29 and 22. Let's see if this, this fragment has any kind of validity to it. Because again, the Christian church and everybody accused us, oh, that ain't, that ain't canon. That, where you get that from? That ain't part of the 66. So let's see how Bereans do it. And let's go to 1 Chronicles 29 and chapter uh, Salakia, yeah, verse 22. Shabbat. Read. And he did eat and drink before the Most High on a day with great gladness. And they made Solomon, the son of David, king the second time, and anointed him unto the Most High to be the chief governor and Zadok to be the priest. So here it is. Solomon's taking the throne after having a beef with his brother, because remember, David's house was in turmoil. His sons was in turmoil because of David multiple wives. But now they have anointed Solomon for the second time as the official king of Israel, and his priest is going to be Zadok. And you know the Most High doesn't do anything uh, haphazardly. The Most High doesn't do anything by coincidence. Zadok's name means righteousness. Zadok's name means righteousness. So let's bring this home and prove that this fragment can be trusted. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 48. Let's go to Ezekiel 48, and let's prove that this fragment can be trusted. Ezekiel 48. Ezekiel 48, Elder, we just, we just pull verse 11. I, I think that's all we need. Okay. Shema. Shema. Read. It shall be for the priests that are sanctified the sons of Zadok, which have kept my charge, which would not astray when the children of Israel went astray, as the Levites went astray. Excuse me. It shall be for the priests that are sanctified of the sons of Zadok, which have kept my Torah, my law, statutes, commandments, which went not astray when the children of Israel went astray as the Levites went astray. So this fragment is validated. This fragment is saying King David couldn't be charged with that polygamy because the Levites dropped the ball. But Zadok came on the scene with Solomon and started to reestablish re righteousness in Israel. Now, Solomon probably didn't get it all the way because we know Solomon imitated his dad. So it probably took Zadok some, some time to get things back in order. But Ezekiel is saying, when we get the new temple, when we get back home, the sons of Zadok who stay righteous are going to run this temple. So the Most High has made a caste system in Levite, in Levi. Those wicked priests, y'all got hell to pay. But the new priests or the sons of Zadok are going to rule the new temple. So this fragment is validated, and multiple wives is not validated. We got precept upon precept. We got to take the whole culture, and then the Torah is our go-to. Adam had one wife, man is to cleave to the wife. The two should be one flesh. All the examples of sister wives in the Bible <laughs> failed and failed. And now we have this all praises be to our Father through the blood of our King. We have this fragment, and like Daniel said, in the last days, knowledge shall increase, where we're getting knowledge from the Most High. This, this fragment confirms that David was wrong, but he didn't know he was wrong. He didn't know he was wrong because the Levites dropped the ball. So with that family, I don't have anything else 
The multiple wife system, the concubine and wives is not kosher, is not approved by heaven, and is not ordained, and it is sin. If you have more than one wife, and that wife is not the, um, the wife of your dead brother, you have whores in your house. You are a whore. You are a whoremonger. That's what the text say. So the only question I can remember, family, is Sister Angela asked a question about the, uh, about the brother who had 30, 30 sons. I did the research. The only time that that man is mentioned is in that verse when he was one of the judges of Israel. So it doesn't say how he got 30 sons. But reading the history we just went over, it's probably safe to assume that he did have multiple wives. But again, this fragment just proves everybody who had multiple wives while the priest had dropped the ball really can't be charged for it. So that man who had 30 sons, his name was um, Osbon, and it, it was in Judges, um, I think it was in Judges 2. I think it was in Judges 2. Uh, Osbon had 30 sons, and he got 30 wives for his 30 sons. And we brought out, it's kind of strange how this man only got one wife uh, per per one of his sons, so she was just wondering how wh how he got 30, 30 sons, and it's more than likely he had more than one wife. But again, that's why I saved this for last. If if we don't have a righteous Levite, um, I, I I'm going to say the brothers. I'm going to try to be objective here. I'm you know don't want to be, you know, too harsh. Um, being that we don't have no righteous priesthood right now. I'm not the most high. Maybe the most high give them a pass. I don't know. But again, y'all doing all these breakdowns and, and, and Adam had one wife. Man is the cleave to one wife. So I don't, I don't know if you got too much wiggle room. But again, I'm not the most high. But I just wanted to bring out that David, David wasn't righteous and having multiple wives. And you know what, Elder? Let's, let's, let's close out with that verse. Let's close out with King David's statement again in 2 Samuel 23. And then I'll uh, open the floor up for any questions, comments, or concerns, and we'll say Shalom. Shalom. Shema. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 2 to 6. Read. Uh, 23, 2 to 6, or 2 and 23? Uh, 23, 23, uh, starting at verse 2. Verse 2, okay. Shema. The Spirit of the Most High spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The Most High of Israel said, The Rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of Yah. And he shall be as a light of the morning, when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Although my house be not so with Yah, yet he hath made me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. So King David is saying, my house wasn't what the Most High wanted. But even though my house wasn't full of light and righteousness, the Most High showed me mercy and he made a covenant with me. And so King David is admitting his faults here. So for any brother or sister who's living a multiple wife lifestyle, if you can humble your heart and take a look at the big picture, this is not Hebrew culture. Anytime we see precepts that are contradicting or appear to contradict, it calls for a deeper study because the most high is not the author of confusion. The most high is not man that he shall lie. And certainly the most high is not a double-minded Allah. So with that, family, I yield the floor for any questions, comments, or concerns.